Uh, my name is Surya Subedi. I'm professor of international law at the University of Leeds in the UK. The United Nations Special Rapporteurs go to the country for which they have been appointed and listen to the normal people, men and women in the streets, who are concerned about the situation of violation of human rights, whose rights have been violated and want to um, express their grievances. So the Special Rapporteur is basically a listening person, listening to the people whose rights have been violated and coming up with some recommendations to the government and to the international community to improve the situation. I will give you an example. Once I was visiting a province in the northern part of Cambodia, I had a meeting with the governor of the uh, province. Then I wanted to go and see for myself what are the situation in the local detention center. And when my diplomatic meeting was over with the governor, I said, can I proceed from here to visit the detention center? He could not say no. Then I proceeded directly from there. Within 10 minutes, I was in the detention center to see for myself, not giving them any opportunity to cover up anything there. Once the country has admitted a special reporter like me, then we have access to various sites, various people, gathering as much information as possible because at the end of the day, my report will be the report of a United Nations expert in human rights. So I would like to make sure that my facts are as accurate as possible. I don't want to be challenged on the facts that I have received. The government may disagree with my recommendations. The government may disagree with my reasoning, but I don't want to be challenged on my facts. That's what I do. On the basis of this primary data and information I will have gathered, I will write my recommendations, present it to the government and to the United Nations. Every member state of the United Nations is under an obligation to cooperate with the United Nations Human Rights Missionary. If you have joined a club, accept the rules of the club. Cambodia has gone through a horrendous past. Nearly 30 years of political conflict resulted in human rights abuses in a massive scale. For instance, during the Khmer Rouge period, estimates vary, but something like between 1.7 to 3 million people were killed. A genocide uh, in a very serious scale was taking place in the country. So the human rights situation, various international institutions are now trying to remedy the situation by bringing those who are responsible for such atrocities to justice. In Cambodia, an international uh, tribunal known as the Hybrid Tribunal. The formal name is uh, Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. It's basically in popular parlance known as Khmer Rouge Tribunal. That tribunal is now trying four of the people who were responsible for the Khmer Rouge atrocities in the late 1970s. As a special reporter, I begin my inquiry by looking at the constitution of the country. In this country, in another country, the first and foremost document that guarantees the people's rights is the constitution of the country. Number of laws have to be enacted to flesh out the provisions in the constitution. So I'm analyzing those laws and recommending that some of the laws should be amended or new laws should be enacted in the country. I'll give you an example with regard to land evictions. People have been living there for a long time, but they have no proof to suggest that it belonged to them because during the Khmer Rouge regime, everything was destroyed. Anybody who had any piece of paper to suggest that it belonged to them. Government archives were destroyed, and people fled the capital city, uh, fled the country, fearing for their life. When you are fear, fled, fleeing the country, fleeing your home, fleeing your villages, fearing for your life, the last thing you would carry is a piece of paper suggesting that so and so belong to you. As a result of that one, many people, especially poorest of the poor, who are living in their homes with a fear that one day they may have to leave. But the, my problem in Cambodia, the implementation aspect of the law is very weak. Laws are there, constitution is there, constitution guarantees a number of civil rights, economic, social, cultural rights, but they are not implemented properly. One has to do uh, what you can for your society. Very many people risk their lives around the globe to bring about democracy, genuine rule of law, and human rights for the people. And these people have made a tremendous contribution. 
the, I'm very much encouraged and inspired by the life stories of very many people who have gone through the same experience and gone through a similar struggle to establish democracy in the country, to assert not only their rights, the rights of the people who have no voice. You have to give voice to the voiceless people. When I was a student, I was concerned about the situation in the country. Nepal did not have a democracy at the time. We are fighting for democracy. We are fighting for human rights. And I was very much involved in that one. I was a student leader, an activist, and also I started writing articles. The degree of unfairness that existed in my own country at the time launched me into this area of human rights. The first time I was arrested and detained, I was 14 years of age. I've been to prison three times, uh, detained twice, and held in long detention for nearly three months. Indeed, my parents were concerned when I was arrested for the first time, so young, what's going on? But then my father himself was a scholar and academic. He let us have that freedom. He said, the choice is yours. This is my advice. And what you want to do is up to you. And he did not interfere that much. And he again realized that I was doing the right thing. I was not into drugs. I was not into some other social evils. I was doing the right thing for the country. So he empathized and sympathized with what I was doing, but I was not happy that I was, I was you know, uh, getting arrested and detained so on and so forth. But after a long period of struggle by many people like me, the country had its democracy restored, and everybody is happy now. If you want to learn more about the situation of human rights, you can visit the website of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in, based in Geneva. The United Nations website in New York will, have, will lead you to, the, uh, to that particular website. You can learn more from that one or by joining some of the international or national or local human rights organizations. The hope that I have is that everybody would be able to live in a democratic society, pursuing their happiness, but without being under any fear. They will not be uh, subjected to violation of their human rights. So it's a civilized society. It's a harmonious society. Everybody abiding by the law that exists in the country. United States is a democratic society, but still human rights violations do occur in this society as well. So do internationally. So we are trying to advance human civilization, making people more civilized so that they do not violate other people's rights. They respect, they learn to respect each other, respect other people's rights when you are exercising your own rights. That's all is about, human rights is about encouraging people to be tolerant, encouraging people to listen to other people, encouraging people to be as accommodative as possible. Democracy is about accommodation of competing interests. One day one hopes the world will be a much better one. People would be able to exercise their rights and achieve whatever they want to achieve in life in an environment where justice, fairness is respected by everybody.